Last class, we talked about some um, additional aspects of sequential circuits. So the first thing we brought out was this idea of a state transition diagram, or state diagram, which just shows if you're given certain states, how you can move between those states. Um, so for example, I'd be example if we have a light switch with a lamp, I don't know, something like that. Um, and the lamp can either be on or off. And there's two push buttons, one's on, one's off. So it has to remember the state to know what to do. Um, so if we're in the on state here, so these are the two states, we can move, for example, to the off state if the off push button goes to one and the on push button is zero. If we're in the off state and you press the off push button again, gain it stays in the off state or it goes back to it. Or if you do nothing, zero, neither of the buttons are pushed, we stay in the off state. Likewise, if we're in the off state, we can move to the on state with the on push button being pressed. And again, we'll stay in that state if either nothing happens or we press the on button again. So the state diagram shows you, for example, that this is the same input, 0 slash 0. Um, and what happens depends on your current state. So if we're in the off state and you hit neither button, we go to the off state, we stay in it. If we're in the on state and we do nothing, we stay in the on state, we go back to the on state. Um, so you can do the same thing with an RS latch, for example. And you can start with the, you can start with the various states um, seen as sort of the Q output. So we have Q of zero or Q of one. Um, and this is what we were called set or reset. So for example, if we're in the Q equal to zero state, the reset state, we can say, okay, if set, I'll do it RS. So if reset set is equal to zero slash one, so set becomes set, we go to that state. Um, if RS is equal to zero one again, we stay in it. Oops. Or if it's equal to zero zero, we also stay in that state. If we're in the set state, we can move to the reset state if reset becomes equal to one um, and set zero. We'll move to some of the invalid states if, for example, reset and set are both one. So this is the invalid state because Q is zero and Q complement zero. Um, and we can get out of those states if, for example, RS um, goes to zero one. So set becomes one, we move from the invalid state out. Typically when we're drawing these state diagrams, um, we may only show the inputs like this, so we may only say one slash one, and somewhere there's a notation saying that the inputs are r slash s. And there we may just say one slash zero. Um, another way to say this is what we'll use, and we'll expand on a lot of this today, is the transition table. So this is saying to go from the zero state to the zero state, um, how can we do that? So to stay in the zero state, set must be zero. And then reset can be one or reset can be zero. One or zero. Um, because if it's one, obviously we'll reset. So we're up in this loop here. But also if it's zero, 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 we're still going to stay at the same state. And I don't know why it crashes so much. So in that case, we have a do not care um, there. We'll have a do not care there. And we can go through and draw sort of all the possibilities to get our state transition table. And the state transition table tells us when we move from one state to the next, um, what, what are the inputs you need to move to that state? So if we go from the one state to the zero state, you can say, just close all this. Uh, you can say, for example, if I go from 0 to 1, I need set equal to 1. Let's start up again. We were down. 
set equal to one. Um, and there's the whole table filled out, so we can see again what are the inputs needed to cause a certain state transition. We can do that for all the flip flops if you want D, the JK, toggle flip flop, and we'd end up with this what I call sort of a master state transition table. So it's showing you to move from any one state to the next state, what are the inputs required for that state? And where we'll use this transition table is when we convert flip-flop types. So say you were given D flip-flop and you want a JK, or you're, you only have a JK flip-flop to design with, and the circuit you're designing needs something like a D flip-flop. So we use conversion of flip-flop types to perform that. So if we assume this was a D flip-flop here, and we want inputs J and K, and we want them to behave like it's a J, K flip-flop, we'll need some sort of combinational logic here to cause that to happen. Um, and when we do this, you have to think about, so the outputs are here, or the inputs are here. So this is what the user sees, the inputs. And the user wants to see these specific transitions. Um, so the user is expecting if Q is zero, and they assert J, um, no matter what happens to K, because if they assert J and K is zero, they expect the output to be set. If they assert J and K is one, they expect the output to toggle. Um, so this table is showing all possible transitions that the user is expecting and how they're expecting to create them. So to do this, we rearrange the table a bit. So first we have the current state here as the and the two user inputs. Um, so we'll just talk about the things we need so we eliminate the next state. And we now just have the current state, the user inputs, and this is the internal. So this is for the D flip-flop. That's what we're trying to generate. Now we rearrange this. So this is everything the user sees. Um, and this is what we have to generate. So with the D flip-flop to if the current state is zero and the user puts J of zero and K, it doesn't matter, we can say we need to input a zero to the D flip-flop to cause the required response. Um, so the procedure is, again, we have that table written out here. So we have current state here. We have inputs here. And the D flip-flop is the type of flip-flop we're designing for. Um, so we write this table down again. So J, K, current state, and D out. Um, and we fill in the do not cares with uh, the possibility. So here we had a do not care, so we have zero. This question mark becomes zero and one because it can be either zero, zero. This question mark, again, could be one or zero or zero, one. Same thing with the rest of them. Um, and so this gives you one big table. And this table is showing you basically what you're going to have to design for. So you have three inputs the two inputs from the user, and then this is the current state. And the one output is to your flip-flop. Um, and we can just do this sort of the normal procedure we design anything with. So we would use a, um, use like a K-map here. So we have the inputs and we can call this J, call this K, call this Q. Um, and you can write down all the possibilities. So we have a one here, for example, one zero one. We have a one here, one one zero, zero zero one, one zero. And there's one missing. One zero zero. There. Um, so then you could say, okay, well, I can just create a map, for example there, um, and there is one possibility. And from that, you can create what the output is equal to. So you can say D is equal to, in this case, we have Q complement ended with, what's this? J is this term, and this term becomes Q ended with K complement. Um, so that's telling you to create a JK flip-flop with a D, we have this equation. And you can obviously implement that. And you can do the same thing if, for example, you have a JK flip-flop, you want to create a D, the same procedure. 
Um, in this case, these are the inputs, so there's only two inputs because we just have a D from the user and a Q, the current state, and two of these intermediate outputs, J and K. Um, so this means we have two K maps we'll create, and again, you can do the same example as we did yesterday. Um, so the second thing we talked about was serial protocols and shift registers. Um, so the most basic register we can come up with is if we use a bunch of D flip-flops. The D flip-flops, you remember, on the clock edge will advance the data from the input to the output. Um, and this is useful because you may have data that's changing. You know, maybe these Ds are switches or they come from some other weird logic. Um, and this is particularly true before when we were talking about combinational logic where we might have glitches. This is another use for them because, for example, if I have this D1 input and it glitches high and then finally goes high and, you know, it takes them a while to settle or whatever, whatever is the cause. Um, I can have these inputs, D0, D1, D2, that, as you can see, are varying a lot in time. But if I just have one clock input here, so this is clock, um, and there's just a single clock pulse over here, um, the output will only sample at this point. So then what the output of this, uh, these flip-flops, this register will be, is just the state of the input to that specific instant in time. Before this, um, there'll be whatever the previous state was. So maybe it was high before, and then it will go low. And this one, you know, maybe was low before, now it goes high. Um, maybe this one was low the whole time. So the point is they're now all changing at once whenever that clock edge existed. Whereas before, you can see they were varying at different times and some of them had glitches. So that's one use of a register is that we can decide at one instant to update all of the outputs. When you're playing with registers, you can actually just place them down as a block really easily. Um, so I showed an example with the board yesterday. If you place this one down, uh, we could connect this to one of the switches and then connect all these to switches as well. Um, so again, these, these are elements in the ISC software. And you connect those to you know LEDs or item LEDs connect them to other logic circuits. And you can set the input switches as you wish, and only once you pulse this switch do the outputs all get updated at once. Um, so you avoid the problem of you know, a bunch of intermediate values existing there. With shift registers, we connect D flip-flops what looks like a series here. Um, so what you can see is that on every clock edge, so if I imagine the clock goes high like this, What's going to happen is there's some data here, and on this clock edge, this data through this flip-flop will advance to this point um, because the flip-flop will now register it. It'll store it and put it to the output. But that same clock edge initially um, is going to be at all of these flip-flops at once. At each clock edge, the flip-flop is going to take the input here and put it to the output. Um, but you have to remember that it's not a case of, you know, this output goes there and then instantly everything's being forwarded. Because the initial state of the flip-flops is sort of right at the clock edge, this data is just going to move across one at a time. So first it'll go here, um, and then the next clock edge, this data will then transfer here, the next clock edge here, and the next clock edge here. Um, so it shifts through this shift register, as they call it. So this is useful for um, serial protocols we'll show later we'll be using them for, because, for example, if I have one data line, um, and we have, you know, assume Q1, Q2, Q3, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3. 
Um, that first clock edge data will be loaded into the first register. So the, the, lot, the value of this data line, which is one, um, and we'll say initially all of these are zero. Um, at that same clock edge, the output of Q0 here is going to be loaded into Q1, Q1, Q2, Q2, Q3. Um, so at this point, before Q0 has gone high, Q1 reads this value there. And so that goes low, goes low, goes low. Um, at this next clock edge, this value is going to be updated there. This value, which is still low, will go there. So then we draw that, and again, that goes there. So you can sort of see how it's shifting through in time. So again, this D value goes there. Um, at this clock edge, again, Q0 stays high. Um, because it's sampled at this point here. Q1 um, becomes the value of what Q0 was. And Q2 will now go high because at that point, Q1 was high. So we go high. And Q3 is still low. Um, finally, for this clock edge here, Okay, and we'll draw it down. So you can see Q3 is sampling Q2 at this point, so Q2 will go high. We're sampling here. Oops, this one stays high. This one stays high. And Q0 is sampling this clock edge here, which is now low, so it goes low. Um, so you can see this pulse is slowly moving through the shift registers. And we can actually use this to shift data in. So each of these points can be a data bit. So this could be a 1, a 1, a 1, and a 0. Um, and after four clock pulses, what you see is these outputs here. So at this point here, the output of the registers are 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, so over a single line, we're sending four bits because these four bits you know, could connect to LEDs or whatever. and display the value of them. So that could be a way to drive a bunch of LEDs over just two lines, the data and the clock. Uh, and we'll play with that a bit in the lab tomorrow. Um, so that's just showing another example of it. Um, in this case, you have to remember, I'd said before, the clock can be negative or positive edge. Um, so if we have the little circle there, this would mean it's negative edge. So in the same scenario, um, whatever the, the data is on the falling edge is what will be sampled. Um, so I think in this one, wouldn't really affect anything. But So instead of this clock edge, we'd be sampling here. And again, there is simple blocks you can just drop down. So this is one example. Um, of a serial to parallel shift register in that Xilinx tool. So we have a serial input. Uh, clock enable, we'll just type a VCC, so it's one. You can have your clock here, and then there's a asynchronous clear. Um, and when you start shifting data in, it'll appear on Q0 to Q3. When we're using these, we'll have some serial protocols we'll use. Um, Serial protocols, there's some different characteristics of them. The bit rate is the bits per second of data being transferred. So you might be, you know, 10,000 bits per second, typically a million bits per second, 20 million, something like that. Um, there's a question of how you shift data out, MSB or LSB first, so most significant bit or least significant bit first. So if I have the number 8, which is equal to binary 1000, um, we can shift this LSB out first, or we can shift the MSB out first. So what this means is that when you look at the data, if I have a clock there, and so say I have four clock edges. Um, if I have LSB first, 
I'm going to shift this zero out first. So it'll be zero, 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 and then go to one. Um, so we have zero, 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 and then one. If it's MSB first, I'm going to shift out this one first, then the zero, then the zero, then the zero. So it would look like that, the waveform. And then zero, zero, zero. So we'd have one. So the MSB LSB first, it's just something to be aware of because when you're dealing with data, it could come either way. And obviously, if you get it wrong, um, all of your bytes will be reversed. So you'll have the wrong numbers. The amount of data you shift out is another characteristic that varies and how many control lines you have. So, for example, SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, um, is a fairly common one, and on Thursday we'll be using that a little bit as well. So we'll have several lines. We'll have a data in and out line. So if one block, we'll have data going out, data going in. We'll have a clock line um, generated by one of them. And we'll have what's called a slave selector, SS. So in SPI, there's a master, and it generates the clock, for example. Um, we have this output line, master out line. And so, you know, if it's sending 1010, zero, zero, it would send something like that. Oops. So you can see that at this clock edge, it's high. This clock edge, it's low, high, low. So it's sending 1010. One, zero, one, zero. Uh, the slave responds with data. So it might be 0, 0, 1, 1, for example. Zero, zero, one, one. Um, and the slave has a dedicated line that it's sending back on. So they're unidirectional lines, as in they have a defined direction. Finally, the slave select, the master uses to select the device. So as you can see by the bar over it, this means it's active low. So normally it's high. Before it sends data, it goes low. And then when it's done sending data, it'll go high. So that tells um, the slave that I'm done sending data to you when it goes high, you know, stop responding to me. So that's SPI, um, and there's just another example. Normally we'll be talking about eight bits at a time with SPI, so one byte is sent, and again, this is showing that in red we have all the rising clock edges here, and it's showing how um, the master out Byte here is being sent, master in is being sent there. I squared C, enter IC, just uses two lines, um, clock, and the data is bidirectional. So if slave select, we had um, data each way, unidirectional, as well as a special line to select the device. With I squared C, all the devices connect to the same two lines, and there's an addressing scheme is used. Um, so the master will first send a byte saying which device I'm going to talk to, and then maybe send it a byte, and the device might respond with some data. Um, so this requires a bit more logic because we have these this unidirectional data line, so only one person can control it at a time. Otherwise, there's an error if two devices are trying to talk at the same point, so they're both trying to take control of the data line. Um, Asynchronous serial, this is what was on a lot of computers where we had a serial port. And here, there's typically just two lines, data in and data out. Um, so you might have a computer and, you know, a device. And there's a data line that goes this way and a data line that goes that way. Um, and that's it. So you notice there's no clock with this type of setup. Um, and this is because the devices generate the clock themselves. So the asynchronous part um, means that there's no clock sent with the data. For free. Synchronous clock would be sent. So they have to generate the clock themselves. Um, the format of it, somewhat similar in idea to the SPI. We have some additional logic to distinguish when we start because they have to synchronize those two clocks obviously for this to work because they have to know okay here's bit zero, bit one, bit two, three, etc. Um, so we have this additional logic that we're calling the start and stop bit here um, which is used 
by one device sending to the other. When the device sees the start bit, it knows a packet's starting, so it can synchronize. It can say, okay, well, however many nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, depending on the speed, I need to now read byte zero, and then one, two, three, et cetera. Um, USB, universal serial bus, is obviously more recent. It also generates the clock locally on each device, um, and it uses a unidirectional data line. So if we have two devices, they share the same line to send data back and forth. Um, so there's also, again, some logic to decide who can control it at what time. With USB, we do use two data lines, but they're sending the same data, so it's D plus, you can see, and D minus, um, which is to say it's differential. So, you know, if D plus is sending this, D minus always just sends the opposite. Um, and we do this because it, it gives you, there's some advantages when we talk about how the data is physically sent over the wire and how it's more robust. Um, but the basic idea is it's a bi-directional line with USB. So that's a quick summary of what we covered last class. I'll take a quick break because I'm going to double